Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Poultry Health Today, and with me is Dr. David Swain. He is a uh, research veterinarian with USDA specializing in avian flu. David, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Obviously, avian flu has had its fair share of headlines in the United States over the past year, but uh, this disease really isn't very new to you. In fact, I understand that your history with it goes back some 30 years. That's correct. So I, I began working on avian influenza as a disease of poultry in 1987 when I was a professor at Ohio State University. Now, there wasn't any avian flu in Ohio at the time. How did you become so interested in this? I was working with another professor. We were doing studies in wild birds. And one form of avian influenza, what we call low pathogenicity, or low pathogenic avian influenza, can be present in migratory waterfowl, or migratory ducks. And so we were studying in ducks in Ohio, finding this virus, and trying to understand better how it's, it was spreading within wild birds, of which it didn't cause any disease in the wild birds, but there was always the potential of crossover into domestic poultry. And that was the root of the concern? That was the root of my beginning in, in working with the disease. And it has gone from there to working in other countries, uh, for example, in Asia, uh, in Africa, helping them work on the more severe form of avian influenza, the deadly form, the highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. Now, the avian influenza that hit the United States in uh, early 2015, that was highly pathogenic. What's really the difference between highly pathogenic and low pathogenic? So the ability of that virus to produce a different type of disease, the low pathogenic viruses, and we define that based upon how easily they can produce disease in chickens and how severe it is. So low pathogenic viruses generally cause uh, an infection of the respiratory tract and the lungs and the nasal cavity. And the highly pathogenic virus is much different. It causes a, a disease that affects the entire body. And you can look at the differences in mortality or the, the death rate, and you'll find that low pathogenic viruses usually produce a fairly low rate of death in, in poultry with respiratory signs but highly pathogenic may produce mortality rates if left in the flock, uh, up to almost 100% of the birds may die. And with the low pathogenic, can that upgrade to uh, highly pathogenic over time? Yes, so from uh, the natural history of the viruses, we understand that these viruses are maintained as a low pathogenic virus in the wild birds, the wild waterfowl, uh, ducks and geese, uh, some of the shorebirds and they circulate without causing disease within those birds. And then on occasion, that low pathogenic viruses of specific types, and the specific types are what we call H5 and H7, if they infect um, poultry, our chickens or turkeys, and circulate for a while within them, then they can change, a way we call mutate, they'll change from being this low path to being the high path virus. And so they would change from producing this respiratory disease to the severe, rapidly spreading disease that can cause high death rates in poultry. So the more recent outbreak in Indiana, that was low path, correct? So the outbreak in Indiana is an example of what I was just speaking of, is that that virus actually was present in wild birds, and it moved as a low pathogenic virus from the wild birds into domestic poultry. And those first farms were infected by the low pathogenic virus. And then that low pathogenic virus mutated while it was on one of these farms to being a highly pathogenic virus. And fortunately, it was detected very quickly, very early, so that first flock of high path virus was identified and it was then eliminated. At the same time, they identified the other flocks that had low path virus and they were eliminated to, to stop the outbreak from spreading. And you mentioned that it was picked up quickly. What tools were in place then that were not in place, let's say, a year ago to catch the virus that early on? Because of the outbreak last year, the, the, the highly pathogenic H5, all across the United States, I think most poultry growers and most poultry companies are aware of that, that particular virus. And the way it spreads from farm to farm is by movement of, say, equipment and people unintentionally. And so, what has really improved in the last year is understanding of biosecurity. And that's methods that you use on your farm to keep a disease from coming on, how you control that. And so throughout all the U.S., um, those methods were, were being employed to, to reduce the potential for coming in. 
And then the farmers or the growers are much more aware of influenza. So if something abnormal happens in the flock, they're very attuned to reporting that uh, to the company, uh, many times the company veterinarian or the field service uh, uh, personnel, so they can do an investigation. And that was what was done in Indiana, is they observed a slight increase uh, in mortality and a drop in water consumption. And so they did an investigation and found the virus very quickly. Do we have a handle on what types of birds were transmitting the disease in the United States in early 2015? So if you're talking about the H5 highly pathogenic? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, initially um, the first cases in the United States were identified in migratory waterfowl. These are ducks. And some cases were found in uh, birds of prey, of which they prey upon waterfowl, and that's how they became infected. Um, and, but very quickly thereafter, there were um, cases identified in backyard poultry in Washington State and Oregon. And then um, the first cases of commercial poultry were in California after there had been multiple cases identified in waterfowl uh, and in birds of prey. So those first poultry cases were intermixing in backyards of wild birds that were infected with domestic poultry. And then later the first cases in commercial poultry were identified. Um, as the um, outbreak unfolded into the Midwest states, there were isolated outbreaks in commercial poultry in some backyard flocks, and then eventually it settled in the Midwest, and there was a very good epidemiologic evidence, which is the study of disease and how it spreads. There was very good evidence of that after that virus um, had circulated for a, a good period of time, it was then able to spread more easily from farm to farm. So. Initially, uh, in the Pacific uh, area, um, Washington, Oregon, California, those first cases in poultry were in introduced from the migratory waterfowl, but as it got into the Midwest, uh, more of the cases were farm-to-farm -farm spread and not involving wild birds. And when you say farm-to-farm -farm spread, is that one truck driving to another, or is it wind or dust? It varies uh, from farm-to-farm, -farm, and in most farms, you never know exactly how did that virus get on the farm? And what you have to do is you have to do a risk assessment. And by doing the risk assessment, you find the weak points, uh, the common points of how things can move from, from farm to farm. And so uh, it's impossible to find an, an individual cause. And usually you find these are the most common risk factors. And one of those may have been the way that it was moved from farm to farm. In terms of uh, avian flu's interaction with other diseases, does it, um, it, it, are some birds going to be more susceptible to avian flu because they have a particular virus in their system for another respiratory disease, for example? If we look at the two different types of viruses that I talked earlier about, the low pathogenic and the highly pathogenic, with the highly pathogenic virus, it's such a deadly virus, it doesn't need a co-pathogen or a co-disease. But the low path viruses tend to be much worse if they have a pre-existing disease condition. So if you have another respiratory virus and then you have the low path influenza come in, what you will see is a much more severe disease for either of those diseases. It could be infectious bronchitis, uh, the birds could be more susceptible from infectious bursal disease, but they all those can interplay with the low pathogenic types of virus. What are your thoughts on avian flu vaccination? So that's a, one of the most controversial aspects of influenza control within the United States and other um, countries within uh, our hemisphere, so Canada uh, and Mexico. And it's really controversial in the European Union and Australia, uh, what we would term developed countries. And the issue is that when you look at, we can't live with highly pathogenic flu, the best solution is to do an eradication program, identify infected farms, and then humanely uh, euthanize the, the birds on that farm and dispose of them in an ecologically sound manner. In some countries where they don't have very good infrastructure, and you mentioned this point about we rapidly identified the Indiana outbreak, but some countries, uh, especially developing countries, have very poor infrastructure and so they can't identify these infected flocks very early and it spreads very far and they are not able to eradicate by the way we do it. We, we tend to, to term the, the programs we use for eradication stamping out programs. And so some of these uh, developing countries are not successful at stamping out. In that case, 
vaccination is used to help them continue to grow poultry in their setting, in their particular country. In the United States, we would prefer to identify the infected flocks and do an immediate eradication and get rid of the disease. Because if you do just vaccination by itself, uh, it's very difficult to do that eradication. And, and once you start, I guess you have to and keep once you doing start, it, yeah, right? Yeah. You really can't stop. Beyond vaccination, beyond, um, which we're not gonna be do doing in this country at, at this point anyway, but beyond biosecurity, what else can poultry producers do to protect their flocks? By far the most important part is the biosecurity that they can actually do. But they also are the eyes and the ears of what goes on um, in the poultry production in the country. So the, the grower, the farmer, the people who work on the farm are the first ones that identify something is wrong with the flock. There could be a disease here. And identifying that very early and reporting it to the company or to the company veterinarian or the service personnel can initiate an investigation very quickly so it can be identified and appropriate actions taken. The other part that I think is critical for us um, is less of an issue for the grower, but it's an issue uh, of, of part of the program, and that is we need to have very rapid diagnostics. And so within the United States, uh, every state that produces poultry has a, a veterinary diagnostic lab that specializes in identifying it. So having them ready to go 24 seven, so when a sample comes in, they can tell you yes or no within just a few hours is very critical in doing it. And also um, what is critical is everybody involved in poultry production being educated on what influenza is and what their role is in early identification, in prevention, and eradication. Well, I'm glad that we have you on our side because um, you obviously have a lot of knowledge about uh, avian flu and uh, I'm sure we'll put it to good use. All right, we've been talking to Dr. David Swain. He's a research veterinarian at USDA. David, thank you again for joining us. My pleasure, thank you.